Ah uh, yes, Generation 2. Often considered by many to be the worst generation for Nuzlocking. Personally, I just feel that this game has a weird pacing to it. You start off making good progress, but by the end, there's this weird branching where you can decide which path you want to take and that makes a whole lot of issues. Of course, like always, ROM hack creators like Dreano tried to make a game like this more Nuzlocke-able by modifying the core of the game. Buffing the trainers, including more Pokemon, you know the gist. Sacred Gold and Storm Silver are one of Dreano's earlier ROM hacks, so they're often considered to be easier. Combined with the fact that Gen 2 just overall isn't that difficult, I think we've got a pretty fun game on our hands. Of course, I'll be using the hardcore Nuzlocke rules you're seeing on screen right now, but if you guys do enjoy this video, please like and subscribe. I have a ton more ROM hacks that I'm planning to play, but if you guys have any suggestions, leave them down in the comments below. Without wasting any more time, this is me beating Sacred Gold in one attempt. Just like how all Nuzlocke start, the first Pokemon you get is going to be the starter you pick. Your starter choice is going to be extremely important because it's likely to be the strongest Pokemon you have for the start of the game. Traditionally, I would choose the Fire Starter because Fire Starters do very well in Johto, but instead I decided to go with the Totodile. This was mainly because I knew there were going to be other starters offered to us, but also to force our rival to have a Meganium, which is undoubtedly the worst of all starters. Throughout this playthrough, my chat constantly reassured me that this was going to be easy. I've completed Blaze Black, Vintage White, and a bunch of other ROM hacks that you can check out on my channel, so going into the start of this game, I was playing a little bit too relaxed. This Elder here challenges you at the top of Sprout Tower. His team really isn't that difficult, but the final Pokemon Hoot Hoot is very scary. Hoot Hoot has Tinted Lens, which makes all of his not very effective attacks do double damage. This is incredibly hard to manage since we don't have any defensive Pokemon this early on. Before even entering the first gym, we've already lost 4 Pokemon, which is nearly half the encounters up to this point. What I had to do to make this first gym battle even somewhat viable is to evolve my Eevee into a Jolteon. Personally, not my favorite evolution, but at this point, I'll just take what I can get. To be fair though, Faulkner only has flying types, which are all outsped by Jolteon. Thus, they can all be taken out with a single Thundershock, giving us an extremely easy first badge. The Eevee is guaranteed, and there's a person who always gives you a Thunderstone, so this first gym badge is basically free. The map of Johto tends to give you a lot of encounters between gym leaders, so between now and Bugsy, we get a couple more encounters. We get a Geodude from the Ruins of Alf, a Togepi from an egg that we hatch, and another encounter in the Dark Cave. Sandshrew is a dupe, Geodude's a dupe, basically we're guaranteed 25% Zubat, or 10% Bronzor, or 10% Aeron, or 5% Gibbles, and 5% Bagon. So really, the only bad encounter is 15% Onyx. Don't worry though, Onyx is still a great Pokemon. It's actually been buffed in this game to have an actual attack stat, along with its decently fast speed. Something I forgot to mention is that just like all other Drano hacks, we're able to get started Pokemon from other regions. That's why you can see a Charmeleon on my team, and not a Totodile. Because it died. This brings us to the second gym leader, Bugsy. Upon first glance, you would say that our team looks pretty good. We got Geodude for defense, Jolteon and Charmeleon for offense, and Linoon and Gyarados are good for coverage. Normally this would be a good team, but this isn't any normal game. The Butterfree starts the battle with a Rain Dance, so I take advantage of this free turn by going for a Rock Throw and taking it out. She responds by sending in her big boy Heracross, so I make a switch of my own swapping in a Charmeleon, not to use Embers, but to use Dragon Rages. The Bug Bites that he hits do steal their Citrus Berry, but not before Dragon Rages take out the Heracross. As a Heracross goes down, the next Pokemon she sends in is Yanma. Not really the strongest Pokemon, so I send in Geodude to hit a Rock Throw and take it out. She tries to hit a Vital Throw by sending in her Pinsir, so I swap in my Gyarados who can get off an Intimidate and tank the Vital Throw easy. Since Gyarados can't really do anything to this Pinsir, I have to switch out back into Charmeleon to get off another Dragon Rage. After taking a Vital Throw, two Dragon Rage is hit in a row, taking out the Pinsir. This just leaves her with two Pokemon left. When she sends in Scyther, I try to counter it with my Jolteon. I swap it in to use a Thundershock, dealing about half health, as the Scyther eats his Citrus Berry and goes for a Swords Dance. He then gets off a critical quick attack to take out Jolteon before Thundershock can take it out. That's one very important Pokemon dead. I send out Geodude to revenge kill, and a U-turn also takes out the Geodude. With the Beedrill out right now, I send in Charmeleon to get off two Dragon Rages to take out the Beedrill. Finally is a Scyther that won't go down. I swap in Gyarados to get off an Intimidate, as a wing attack hits and activates my Citrus Berry. I try to swap in Linoon to get off a Stab Headbutt, but a critical wing attack takes it out instantly. I then send in my last resort Togetic, who can thankfully get off a Tri-Attack to take out the Scyther. What a horrific battle that ended in 3 deaths, but at least the run's still alive and we have 2 badges. Again, we're going to catch some more counters before moving on. We catch a Nidoran just under the National Park, we catch a Scyther just in the National Park, 
and we catch a Growlithe just outside the National Park. Goldenrod also offers you one of the Sinnoh starters, which, of course, we chose Chimchar. This brings us directly into the Whitney fight for the third gym badge. Whitney is canonically very difficult in the original games, and believe me when I say I was scared to enter this battle. I'm not really good against normal types, so I start with a Dragon Rage with Gyarados to whittle down the Licky Tongue. All we have to do is take a reduced Body Slam, and the second Dragon Rage takes out the Licky Tongue. Clefable would just love to go for a Charge Beam to both take out Gyarados and boost his special attack, so a switch into Nidoking takes a Charge Beam, and a Double Kick hits before the Clefable can set up a Reflect. I make the switch into Krogunk because the Clefable now wants to go for a Water Pulse, and it's here that I learned that the AI won't go for another move if its most damaging move is nullified by an ability. Krogunk's Dry Skin ability soaks up the Water Pulse, yet the Clefable refuses to use another move. Fine by me though, I'll take the freebie. I stay in with Krogunk against the Lopunny, and use a Revenge as she tries to go for a Dizzy Punch. We do get confused, but we manage to hit through the confusion to get the boosted revenge hit and take out the Lopunny in one shot. This battle's going surprisingly well. I switch out of Krogunk and into Scyther to take the Psychic, and hit a big wing attack before we get attracted by the Wigglytuff. I switch out into Monferno to take an Ice Beam, and a Rock Smash takes out the Wigglytuff. I'm actually- <laughs> I'm actually so surprised at how well we're doing. She only has two Pokemon left. Stantler's Intimidate cuts my attack, so I gotta do the same and switch out into Gyarados. Stantler misses his Zen Headbutt, so two Dragon Rages takes him out too. As she sends out a dreaded Mill Tank, I switch back out into Krogunk to tank a Body Slam and hit a boosted Revenge. The damage almost takes her out, but Krogunk is weak, so I have to make the switch into Scyther as she uses a Super Potion. I hit a big Wing Attack, dealing about half health before I get attracted by the Mill Tank, thus needing to switch into Nidoking. On the plus side though, Scyther baits the rollout from the Mill Tank, so now with the Mill Tank locked into rollout, I can hit a double kick on the Mill Tank to take it out, getting us the victory to this battle. In the underground of Goldenrod, there is a rival battle against Lyra, but she was very easy to beat considering that I already have 3 badges, and I was much higher level than her. Between now and Morty, we get ourselves 2 encounters. One is a Mighty Enna in the grass, and the second is a gifted cast form. These two Pokemon make the rival battle in the Burnt Tower much easier. Our rival leads with Murkrow, so I lead with our new cast form. After checking its moveset, it seems that Cast Form kept Powder Snow, which makes it incredibly useful against the Murkrow. After tanking two wing attacks, Cast Form was then able to take out the Murkrow. His Haunter has nothing on Gyarados, so after making the swap, a single bite was able to take it out. The next Pokemon he sends in is his Kadabra, which I know gets walled by our Mighty Enna, but apparently the AI knows this too and actually swaps out into Magby. I make a switch of my own into Nidoking and use a dig to take out the Magby, and decided to stay in for the Kadabra as well. Not sure why, not a good decision. Thankfully, I do go unpunished as he goes for a Miracle Eye, but then I do miss my own dig. I make the switch into Scyther to hit a Fury Cutter, which almost takes out Kadabra, so I use Wing Attack next to take it out. Finally, it's his Bayleaf that can do nothing to Scyther, so I stay in with the Wing Attack to finish it off. Pretty simple rival fight if you ask me. Well, not much to do now except for Morty. He starts the fight with a bulky Duskull, so I lead with my Intimidate Gyarados. A single bite takes him down to red health as he hits me with a Confuse Ray. Knowing that he will heal next turn, I go for the switch into Charmeleon to try to get rid of the Confuse Ray. I try for Flamethrower to see how much damage it does, but it's not enough so he hits me back with another Confuse Ray. Since I'm already confused and he's not in red health, I know he's not going to go for another heal or Confuse Ray, so I switch into Gyarados on a Shadow Ball and a Bite takes out the Duskull. Mistrevis also goes down to two Bites, but not before burning us, which means that Gyarados can no longer be used. The Gengar he has tries to go for a Thunderbolt to take out my Gyarados, but a Crunch from Mediana takes out the Gengar in one hit. Crunch also then proceeds to take out the Shuppet, leaving him with two Pokemon left. Sableye is a little bit harder to deal with since it doesn't have any weaknesses, so I just go for the Dragon Rages from Charmeleon to take it out. It does take a while because it knows Recover, so I use Wing Attacks from Scyther instead to finish it off. Finally, his last Pokemon Haunter gets outspied by Scyther and dies to a critical Wing Attack, finishing the 4th Gym Leader. Again, another pretty easy fight. So far this game has been pretty simple. Catch the encounters, then beat the Gym Leader. Nothing too special just yet. Of course, we do have the Olivine City plot with the sick Amphi, the Ampharos, but that doesn't really contribute to the Nuzlocke. What really does though is that between now and the next gym, we can get a bunch more encounters. We're going to reach a number of Pokemon where any deaths won't really affect our run that badly, since we'll have enough Pokemon to cover for the loss. We get a bunch of water types, Farfetch'd and Luxio, and one more special encounter. It seems like I get one of these in every one of my challenges. I don't know what's up with these Kingdras. This is quite literally, if you go back and watch all my ROM pack Nuzlocks, you will always find a Kingdra. It's uncanny. Just before entering the battle with Chuck, I make sure to do the Skarmory trait to get myself a Covenant Orb, and evolve my Kadabra into Alakazam. I'm pretty sure you can imagine how this fight went. That's one down. That's two. That's three. That's four. Okay, that's five. One last Pokemon. 
And that's six. Easy sweep. God, can Chuck get any easier? After this point, we're able to get Fly and fly back to the places we've been before. And here, I want to get a Pokemon that I really wanted to use. If you go back to New Bark Town and interact with the TV, you can get a Rotom. But since of course this is where we got our starter Pokemon, Rotom is technically considered an illegal encounter. But I really wanted to use it because it's one of my favorite Pokemon. I really love the gimmick behind it, but it sucks that it's a static slash gift Pokemon. So I decided to make a trade. Since I did want this Rotom really badly, I would have to trade a Pokemon of high value to the Nuzlocke. I ultimately decided on Nidoking here. Not only is it just a great Pokemon overall, but it's extremely useful to me right now at this point. We don't have any other ground type Pokemon other than Shellos, and that's not really going to do anything for us. So really, I'm giving up my only viable ground type Pokemon for a Rotom. Is this fair? Is this allowed? These are all questions for you to answer and not up to me. It did feel okay in my mind though, so I'm going to allow it. After clearing the Ampharos situation at the Olivine Lighthouse, I head to the Goldenrod Mall to get myself a Rotom form. I decided upon the Rotom fan form because the move that it learns, Air Slash, is much more reliable than Hydro Pump or Overheat. Finally, at this point do we actually get some story. Turns out, Team Rocket has taken over the Cliff's Edge Gate, and it's up to us to force them away. We engage in a bunch of double battles, including with Mira, Bucky, Cheryl, and Riley. You also engage in some single battles against the Rocket Admins, but they have very similar Pokemon to the Rocket Grunts, so you can bring the same Pokemon and do just fine. One important battle that I do want to highlight is a double battle against Archer and a Grunt with Riley. This battle was designed so that you will struggle against the opponents. The Pokemon that Riley brings in are Absol, Ursaring, and Lucario. Absol and Ursaring aren't that special, but Lucario is decently good, but gets outclassed by all of Archer's Pokemon, Zangoose, Gyarados, and Houndoom. Zangoose here knows close combat, which can easily one-shot all of Riley's Pokemon. Gyarados knows Dragon Dance and can easily set up on you, and Houndoom is just incredibly scary with Fire Blast. What I did in this battle to ensure my victory was to solely target Archer's Pokemon. Farfetch here has buff stats and is actually a flying fighting type, so he can't really be hurt by the Scizor on the field. By using Pokemon that can't be hurt by the Scyther on the field, you can easily 1v1 Archer while the opponents target your partner Riley. This simplifies the battle into two easy 1v1 fights. We get thanked for driving out Team Rocket with a battle against Jasmine. Jasmine uses the Steel Typing, which is incredibly defensive, but at this point, we have enough options to come up with a solid team. Charizard here is equipped with a Charcoal to boost his flamethrower damage and can take out the Matang in one hit. Magneton also goes down in one hit since it only has Generation 4 Sturdy. I expected Bronzon to take a little bit more effort, even going for a Fire Blast, but that only does about half health and puts us to sleep with Hypnosis. At first I was confused as to why it only did half health since Bronzong isn't that bulky, but then I soon realized that it has Heatproof to watch out for. I swap into Camerupt to try and use an Earth Power, but she also swaps out into Fortress, which is kind of odd in this sense. So I use a Flamethrower to take out the Fortress. Her Steelix comes in trying to get off a super effective Earthquake or Stone Edge, so I swap in Gastrodon to hit the Steelix with Surf. It nearly takes it out, bringing it down to the red health, where it activates its Citrus Berry, bringing it out of potion range. Steelix goes for a useless Screech as a second Surf takes it out. Her second last Pokemon, Skarmory, comes out and poisons my Gastrodon as I go for a Rain Dance to boost my water moves. In hindsight, this probably wasn't a smart move because now this prevents me from using any of my Fire type Pokemon, but in the moment, it seemed right. Since none of my physical or fire type Pokemon can be used, I swap into Lantern which can use a super effective Thunderbolt to take out the Skarmory. Her final Pokemon Bronzong comes back out as I hit a Thunderbolt, bringing it down all the way to red health as Bronzong puts my Lantern to sleep. I make the switch into Skarmory as Bronzong gets healed, and then I swap into Camerupt to use the Earth Power. It nearly takes it out, and Bronzong simply goes for a Rain Dance the next turn, so another Earth Power finishes off the Bronzong, earning us the 6th badge. The plot of the game with Team Rocket doesn't continue just now, so I decided to make some progress in the Nuzlocke. On Route 42, this hiker gives us the HM for Strength, which has changed to be a Rock-type move of 75 base power. We also obtain a Voltaic Ore, which allows us to evolve our Magneton into a Magnezone, and our encounter for this route is Hippopotas. In the cave above, a Hariyama appears, making it our encounter for Mount Mortar, and in Blackthorn City, we're given a Riolu Egg by Riley. The Lake of Rage just above offers us a guaranteed Feebas because the only other encounter is a Magikarp. Finally, something that's worth mentioning is that the Shiny Gyarados is actually a usable encounter. Not sure if you guys know this, but I do play with a Shiny Claws, and since our Gyarados is still alive, we can replace it if we want to. I decided to make the exchange because while the new Gyarados has slightly lower attack, it is much faster than our old Gyarados. Johto offers you a lot of encounters for the game, and unfortunately I can't cover all my encounters, so here's a look at my box just for an update. This next part of the game is a long, long series of grunt battles. If there's anything I know about Gen 2, is that this part of the plot is the least fun to me. There are just way too many grunt battles for me to destroy. It's almost like they're trying to make you overlevel. 
thankfully though, this ROM hack does spice it up with a couple interesting fights. The first battle worth mentioning is against Petrol. No one of his Pokemon is really that difficult to deal with, but rather all of his Pokemon have a very wide range of coverage moves. This makes it very difficult to plan a team that can easily defeat all of his Pokemon. In fact, most of the Rocket Leaders are exactly like this. Weezings, Mucks, and Skuntanks. All very defensive Pokemon with a wide move pool. Since only a limited amount of my Pokemon can actually not be affected by their diverse move sets, you'll often find me using the same Pokemon for each of these Rocket Leaders. With the first one Archer defeated, it brings us to the 7th gym with Price. Price in this game runs a Hail Team which is very scary to deal with. The only way I could think of making this battle easier is by simply removing the Hail altogether. By leading with my Flying type Rotom, this baits a Blizzard from the Obama Snow that can be tanked by my Politoed with Drizzle. Now with the Hail gone, I can safely swap into Infernape which can close combat the Obama Snow to take it out. We can't be using Fire Moves here because our Fire Moves will be reduced by the rain. He sends out Dugong which can see a kill with Surf, but my Infernip is much faster and can outspeed and close combat the Dugong to take it out. I can't say I can one-shot the Lapras though with close combat, so here I make a huge mistake. I swapped in Politoed here which doesn't have any offensive potential against the Lapras because its only other move is Focus Blast. What happens is that we become locked in with Whirlpool, and then the Lapras goes for a Paris Song guaranteeing my Politoed's death. What I should have done here is to swap into Toxicroak. Of course, since Toxicroak has Dry Skin, it won't be affected by the Whirlpool, and it has Cross Chop that can easily two-shot the Lapras if not straight up kill. I then make a second mistake by overestimating the power of my Farfetch'd, and the Night Slash barely brings a Frost Slash to yellow health. He then hits the 50% Blizzard to take out my Farfetch'd, causing us to lose two Pokemon in this battle. Thankfully, I can send in my Toxicroak to Sucker Punch the Frost Slash, taking it out. His Mamoswine is slow, so a Cross Chop finishes him off, and same with the Glalie which is changed to a Rock Ice type. Finally, as a Lapras comes back out, I hit it with a Thunder Punch to finish the battle, winning us against Price. What a sad, sad battle. This fight could have easily been deathless, but I made two lousy mistakes which caused us to lose two good Pokemon. But the mistakes don't end here. This was against a random grunt in the Goldenrod Radio Tower. Was I at full health for that? I was not, okay. To be fair, it's not the best ground or fire type, so I'm not that disappointed, but... What? Alright. At the top of the radio tower, we fight against Petrol again, who hasn't changed his team, so this fight goes just as it did before. Then in the undergrounds of Goldenrod, we get ambushed by a rival again into another battle. You know what? That's on me. That's on me for not checking where the next rival battle is. Okay, thankfully I healed, but we're gonna have to power through with this team. To be fair, this battle wasn't difficult. We're able to send out our Pokemon one after the other to 1v1 the opponent's Pokemon and win the battle simply due to type matchup. The team that I have also happens to be really aggressive, boasting high speed and offensive stats, obviously excluding Hippowdon. The next three fights are against the Rocket Admins, Proton, Ariana, and Archer. They're all single battles which makes the fight against them relatively easy enough that you don't have to do any major prep, but I do make a slight mistake on Proton. I believe a Psychic can kill this thing. We have three levels of, of advantage, and we're an Alakazam. <laughs> no! Live somehow, somehow! Ah, oh, you piece of shit! Why do you have 13? Special attack IP. Ariana comes and goes quite easily, so there's no problems here, but the next fight against Archer is actually placed back to back with Giovanni. I hadn't realized this yet because the docs say nothing about it, so I only really planned for Archer. Zangu simply goes down to an Aura Sphere, so he's not really a problem, and neither is Machamp, which I can pivot into Skarmory and Brave Rhythm Machamp to defeat it. However, an unlucky mistake happens when the Houndoom is sent out. Alright, let's go here for an Earth, uh, for a dig. It's a quad resist too. Dark pulse. This kills. Yeah, but that okay, that crit's kind of scary because now we don't have a counter for. Oh no! Oh no! I think we might be dead. I didn't know I had a focus sash. Or, okay, well now I see it. I, was, I guess I just wasn't paying attention. Yeah, that's just a mistake on my part. There's really nothing I can say about it because I just simply wasn't paying attention. At the very least, the next three Pokemon do go down quite easily, but that means that we're going to be entering the following Giovanni fight without a Flygon. 
To be fair to the game though, at least this fight wasn't made impossible. Giovanni's team consists of only normal types and ground type Pokemon. This means that Lucario can take care of the normal types, while Gyarados takes care of the ground types. I really didn't have to use any of my other Pokemon, so this fight was actually quite easy in comparison. With the Team Rocket plot finally being resolved, at last we can make some progress in our Nuzlocke. While traversing through the ice path, we catch ourselves a Dugong as an encounter, and make it to Blackthorn City. Here, our encounter is a guaranteed Dratini, since the only other encounter is Magikarp, but something really, really weird happened. What is that? Do you guys see that? It's a shiny, apparently. I'm throwing a Master Ball. Whatever this is, hopefully this doesn't like glitch out my save file and just delete everything. So it turns out this really was just a glitch, because when I checked my box, there was nothing there. But obviously since I can't find any Dratini in Blackthorn City, I decided to just hack it in with PK Hex. It's a guaranteed encounter, so I don't want to see any comments saying that I hacked in a Dratini, okay? Now that we've reached Blackthorn, we can finally prep for Claire. Remember that Dugong we got in the Ice Path? Well, that's actually one of the worst encounters we can get in that area. We could have gotten a Weavile, Jinx, Frostlass, even a Delibird would have been okay since it's so buffed in this game. The only encounter there that's maybe worse than Dugong is probably Glalie, but situations like this happen, so we'll move on and go to the gym leader. Claire being a dragon type leader has one glaring weakness. All of her Pokemon are weak to ice or rock. Unfortunately, I don't have any reliable rock type Pokemon, and Dugong's my only reliable ice type Pokemon. Her starting Pokemon Dragonair isn't actually that strong or fast, so Dugong can outspeed and obliterate the Dragonair. When the Gyarados comes out, I did the calculations, and my Electro can actually outspeed the Gyarados even after a plus one from Dragon Dance. Therefore, our Thunderbolt can take him out. Her second Dragonair tries to go for an Outrage, but my super bulky Skarmory can take the Outrages and Brave Bird the Dragonair. We don't take recoil damage because we're Rockhead, and we also have Leftovers Protect to recover some HP. The Salamence he sends in sees a 100% kill range with Fire Blast, which gives Gyarados the perfect switch in to use a Dragon Dance and Ice Fang the Salamence for a kill next turn. With the setup Gyarados with plus one attack and speed, we finish off the rest of Claire's team by Ice Fang in the Altaria which one-shots, and swapping in Toxicroak on a Hydro Pump to cross-chop the Kingdra to death. This earns us the final batch of the Johto region, now making us eligible to go to the Elite Four. There's only a couple things left to cover before we get to the Pokemon League, so let's go over those first. The first task on our list is to defeat all the Kimono Girls. We have to fight all seven Evolutions back to back, without healing, and without switching our Pokemon. This is actually quite easy though, because we can simply start with our Crobat, which is faster than all of the Evolutions, and you turn out into a Pokemon that does super well against them. So the Kimono Girls go down no problem. After heading up the Bell Tower and sacrificing the Red Chicken, we make our way through Victory Road, where there's one last obstacle that stands in front of us. Our rival. The last rival battle. The last battle before the Elite Four. He's dedicated his entire existence to just crushing us, so this fight has to be difficult, right? Well, as it turns out, not really. At this late in the game, our team is diverse enough so that we can always have a counter for whoever they send in. For each of his Pokemon, I have a Pokemon on my team that can take whatever attack it wants to hit me with, and revenge kill with a super effective move of my own. Scizor baits a Flamethrower? That's okay. Send in Kingdra and use a Surf to take out the Megmortar. Kingdra baits Shadow Ball? Toxicrow can come in and sucker punch the Gengar until it's dead. It's that easy. And with that, our last obstacle is defeated. If you guys have made it this far, then I really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. This game took a long time to play and even longer to make, so I really hope that the effort I put in was worth it. As always, you guys can like and subscribe, and leave a comment on the video. I haven't really given you guys a lot of excitement or I've done a lot of live reactions, so I'm not going to voice over the Elite Four here. Of course, as always, I hope you guys enjoy the Elite Four battles. So, first, the Psychic Type Elite Four. We have a couple good answers to him. He leads off with a Jinx. I hate this Pokemon. We are going to outspeed it and kill it with a simple Bullet Punch Technician. I like to see that. Slowbro, as anticipated, will have Flamethrower. We are going to swap into not Starmie, uh, Ludicolo, because Starmie actually doesn't have a good move to kill it. A simple Giga Drain will get us out of this. Look at that. Look at that. And we're healed all the way up to full. Uh, Amnesia to plus two. No kill. Psychic is fine. 
That's a crit. Because now it's especially way too bulky, I think our option is to switch into either Toxicroak or Scizor to kill it with a physical move. We swap in a Scizor for the Psych. Okay. Zatu. Ah. Interesting. Psychic and Air Cutter both won't do that much damage either. I think we'll just go for the Hydro Pump. And I forgot to give you a uh, Wide Lens. I probably should have swapped into here instead of using the Hydro Pump anyway, but whatever, it's fine. Nice and easy. Should hopefully go for Soul Rock for Stone Edge. But no, this is a Lunatone for Ice Beam. We already used up our Lumberry, so no freeze here is good. Forgetting that wide lens is really not paying off, guys. It's really not paying off. Okay, easy. I don't know why I doubted Lucario. Okay, back to Slowbro for the Flamethrower. Flamethrower, I guess we can go into here. We are decently specially bulky. So I feel like this switch should be okay. That's fine, that's fine. I think we do live a crit, so let's go for the Thunderbolt. Soul Rock wants to go for a Stone Edge. I think it'll kill. This is like base 65 defense, special defense. So. I'm pretty sure this will kill. Yeah, easy. Gardevoir. Possible Hypnosis. Possible Reflect. Very likely to go for Psychic. Let's swap into Scizor and get off a Bug Bite. Oh, it's faster. Yeah, it's faster. I don't know why I'm surprised. I don't know why I'm surprised. First Elite Four down. Kind of messed up there with the uh, Hydro Pump misses. But not, I should definitely have Surf there, but other than that, I think we're okay. Okay, Koga. This one's a little bit harder to deal with because his, uh, his poison types are extremely bulky for some reason. Bug Psychic Venomoth here. We have Air Slash with Sharp Beak. Should hopefully be enough damage. Venomoth is not bulky. Venomoth is not bulky. In fact, I almost think it was not worth putting Shark Beak and instead keeping Leftovers, but that's fine. Muck here wants to go for a Rock Slide. This is a Quad Resist. We made sure to... Let's go here to Starmie because Starmie is a little bit better at taking Focus Punches. Dunk Shot. Here it is. Live, live, live. Fuck. Oh my god. And this psychic to kill. Oh my god. Uh, Weezing. Uh, this is 50 50 between like the Thunder and Fire Blast. I think we can just kill this though with psychic. I think psychic should just be able to kill. We are Twisted Spoon. Good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Kill. Kill. Perfect. Uh, this, we should be able to sleep from here. Uh, Thunderbolt, of course. Even if it sucker punches, we're fine. Nice. Koga. Quite easy. Quite easy. Bruno is just gonna be a Starmie and Rotom fan sweep. I think that's gonna be how it is. 
hit him on top. Intimidate, doesn't matter. We are going to air slash this. Okay, die to an air slash. Okay. Should also die. Winners. Okay, nice and easy. Alright, where does this go to? Machamp? Stone Edge. I see. Pretty sure Psychic is the only move that kills. Uh, Twisted Spoon Psychic from Starmie is like 10% more damage than uh, Air Slash from Rotom. So I'm pretty sure this was the only range that kills. This was like 75% <laughs> chance to kill. Lucario, I think I think we're good now. I think we're in the clear. Probably wants to dark pulse us. Ah, we're speed tied. Okay. Alright, that's like 55% health. I think regardless of whether or not we can, we have to, and that's our only play. We should be fine. Okay, I was gonna say, that had to be a crit. That had to be a crit. Fuck! No! I forgot we're not ghost type! No! We live this, right? Oh, that's horrible. That's horrible because we kind of need that electric coverage. We needed that electric coverage. Okay, so losing Rotom it is def it was definitely not part of the plan. If Okay, fuck. Okay, so we, we lost uh, Lucario. Basically, if Mightyena was a male, we would not lose Lucario. But now we, we have lost Lucario, right? Our win condition depend on whether or not this Mightyena was a male or female. If it was male, we could set up a bulk up while we tanked a Fire Fang. Um, close combated the uh, Bunch Crow. Houndoom, I think we outspeed. Uh, I'm going to try to play this as safely as possible. Trying to preserve Lucario if I can. If I can't, then I have to sack him. Because in all, in all honesty, we only need Starmie, maybe Ludicolo for the champion. Surf it up, boys. I, I don't see this surviving. Spiritomb. Spiritomb now is really bad. Spiritomb's really hard for me to counter. It's gotta be here. Yeah, I, my counter has to be Scizor. I, I don't see any other possibility. We'll bug bite. See how much damage we're doing. That's actually not bad. That's pretty sweet actually. Okay. That's a freebie. Here's the freaking haunt crow. Okay, so it sees a brave bird, so we will have to switch and possibly sack. Anyone sacking, it's Lucario. Okay, Swagger. That's fine by us, I guess. I guess in this case, no harm in going close combat. If we hit through it and we kill, I'll take that. Obviously, now that I've said it, it's not going to happen because I just nullified it. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Unlucky. Okay. Yeah. From this range, we should be able to kill it with uh, Fox Approach. We are stone edging. We're wide lens stone edge, so we're 88% accuracy. Perfect. Uh, Absol, this should be fine. So let's cross chop. Fucking hell! Are you serious? Are you serious? Oh my god. We're dead, we're dead, we're dead, we're dead, we're dead, we're dead. I guess you can't rely on those 88% too many times. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is gonna be a three Pokemon champion fight. I think I have a foolproof plan, basically. Gyarados is actually faster than us, and we actually can't kill it with Thunderbolt on Starmie. But to get enough chip damage, 
A U-turn is enough. Aqua Tail Crit will not kill us because it does less than half, but U-turn will give us just enough chip. It's only eight. Da it's only eight percent damage, but that's all we need to be able to outspeed and kill with Starmie. Thunderbolt outspeeds and kills. Perfect. Nice and easy. If you're wondering why we couldn't give it Magnet, it's because we had to give it uh, Nevermelt Ice. Okay, Aerodactyl is the only Pokemon on his team that outspeeds Starmie. And it, I'm pretty sure it wants to go for a Stone Edge. Okay, so we're gonna go into Ludicolo. Aerodactyl crits Ludicolo at any point throughout the sequence. Torment is okay. Aerial Ace is fine. Just don't crit us. Okay. Okay. Ludicolo is Swift Swim, so rain boosts our speed. So we're faster than the Aerodactyl, and it should give us enough power to kill the Aerodactyl with Surf. Perfect. Protect to use up the Torment turn. Outspeed and kill with Surf. Perfect. Now everything that needs to die to Surf is dead. Everything else should go down with Ice Beam. We should outspeed and should go down with Ice Beam. Perfect. It's fine. We have a Starmie in the back that can do the exact same thing to this thing. Ludicolo, you did your job well. Nevermelt Ice ensures that this will kill. Okay, five down, one to go. And Ice Beam will kill. Come on. Finally! Oh my god! I am so stressed. Two options here, right? What do we do next? Do we do the rest of Kanto? We can move on to another game. Probably Sinking Sapphire. The rest of Kanto? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do the rest of Kanto. 